Hello and a good morning to you. Thank you for staying with KTN. My name is Sophia Wanuna and as you have seen on that bumper there, it is time for person of interest. And today we have none other than the CIA Senator James Orango joining us. We thank you so much, sir, for making time uh, to be with us. Early morning. Yeah. Yeah, but well, it's good to be here. Though. It's good to be here. Thank yeah, you so thank much. You. And yeah. a lot to discuss. Of course, yesterday, uh, submitting those signatures for Kwa Kenya to IBC, and we'll get to all that. But uh, CIA is where the people you're representing now in the Senate. Is that where you were born, though? Yeah, I was uh, born in Kisumu, okay. but uh, brought up, uh, surprise, surprise, in Nyeri, in a place called Kig Kiganjo. Really? And then later on in my young, uh, age, at a very l young age, I lived in Nairobi. Okay. Uh, that was during the period of Mamao. And then uh, later on, my father took me back to Uganya. Mm -hmm. And the reason being uh, was that the only languages I could speak at that time was Swahili and Kikuyu. So he's saying, I'll oh, go back to the village. So you're fluent in Kikuyu? No, 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 I forgot all of it. Despite the fact that <laughs> I went to school again in Kikuyu uh -huh. at Alliance High School. Okay. Yeah. So what is it that got your parents to move then to Nyeri? My father was a police officer. And uh, he was working at the Kiganjo police station as uh, a trainer of policemen. Mm. Um, at that time, he was uh, the rank of the chief inspector. Uh, and one of the uh, beautiful photographs of uh, my father was one, he was one of the policemen who was chosen mm -hmm. to go to London during the inauguration of, uh, or the coronation of the Queen Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that was around 1952, mm -hmm. if I'm not wrong. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right, that's interesting because yeah. then you, I, I thought when you learn a language, especially when you're young, it's very difficult to unlearn it, quote unquote. Yeah, that's. Uh, surprise, <laughs> and I, I can't come to terms with it. Yeah, with it. But, uh, you know, when I was taken back to the village, mm -hmm. you know, nobody else in the village could understand the Kikuyu language. Yeah. So um, everybody around me, you know, was this little guy who could not speak, you know, the language that everybody was speaking. Was speaking. Yeah, so I think um, it took me an extra effort to, yeah. to try and learn the language because when I started going to school, you know, the medium of communication those days in primary school was, you know, uh, the local vernacular. The vernacular. Language, yes. And so this whole time you went to Alliance, you say, um, what is it uh, the younger Rengo then aspired to do to become? Yeah, I, I, uh, I was more interested in, uh, you know, the arts, although I was doing very well in mathematics and uh, the sciences. Mm -hmm. um, we had three streams. And uh, stream number three at the Alliance at that time when we were in Form 1 were people who were good in, in the maths and in the sciences. Right. Uh, but as I progressed, uh, I preferred, uh, you know, uh, doing law. I think I, I, I uh, could imagine at that time, at one time, being a lawyer. Mm -hmm. But my very first year, uh, you know, and probably that's why I ended up in politics. In that very first year I was at Alliance, uh, we had visits from uh, Jomo Kenyatta, who was president at that time. Wow, okay. We had Tom Boyer, uh, we had Janamogi Ogingo Dinga, mm -hmm. and we had uh, Ronan Gala. Mm -hmm. And Ronan Gala at that time had uh, uh, a son at Alliance High School, so he was a regular visitor. And then later on, uh, Jeremiah Nyaga also used to come to school quite mm -hmm. often mm -hmm. because many of the Nyagas were at Alliance High School. Yeah. Us, yeah. So seeing these politicians, you thought to yourself, I'd like to be in such a position of power, I'd like to be an influencer, I'd like to be part of the decision making, what no, was no, it? Not quite the power, but you know, everybody was talking the language of transforming society. Mm -hmm. From different perspectives, like uh, you could see at that time the difference between Mboya uh, and Yaramogi Ogingo Dinga. Uh, and of course, Kenyatta, you know, really was not ideologically oriented at that time. Right. But you could see that, uh, you know, the different dir directions that they took and which led them to go separate ways. Mm. But it was a good introduction okay. uh, in the nature of knowing something about, you know, politics and public life. So did you get into student politics at campus? N not so much at Alliance. Uh, at Alliance, I was in the debating club. Mm -hmm. 
but I was very much, uh, you know, in the, in things like Christian Union. Mm. I used to go to. to Are you the chairman? I, no, 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 I never <laughs> rose to be chairman. Okay. But I used to go in the villages around uh, Alliance High School, like Fogoto, okay. and teach at the Sunday schools every Sunday. Wow. I would go out there and you know teach little kids. Mm. Although we also kids, but yeah, we offered to go out on Sundays. So how would you say your political journey then began? Uh, my political journey began really after I left Alliance High School and now came out of the university. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the University of Nairobi was very active. There were, there were, there were no, many debates going on uh, at, uh, at the university, okay. uh, which uh, same thing was happening at Dar es Salaam, uh, at Makerere. And a lot of public leaders would come and give lectures at, uh, at the university. Right. And one of the debates that was going on at that time was the Middle East crisis. And one time the Israeli ambassador came to address us mm -hmm. from their own perspective what was happening mm -hmm. in the Middle East. And then I think one of the leader, leaders in the Arab League came to the university. So um, in that very first year, uh, developed an interest uh, with the leadership in the Students' Union. And in my second year, I became the president of the Students' Union. Wow. Um, I mm -hmm. campaigned against somebody who is still my friend, Wamwangi um, Kinudia. Okay. Yeah, the head of the Transitional Authority. All right. Uh, we fought a battle, but you know, again, it was not a battle that later on I could see in the university on tribal lines. It was basically on what are you going to do for the students, yeah. what do you stand for, uh, and would share a platform, um, and that was very interesting. So the transition now to other politics, uh, did you at any time interact with national politics as a student? Because we've seen those kind of times when a student, they're unhappy with things happening in the country and they'll protest or this and the other. Did you have any kind of those incidences? Yes, there was uh, the relationship that I began early uh, with uh, Jeremy Gilgingo Dinga, mm -hmm. uh, and that was at a time a lot earlier actually when I was in primary school. Mm. There was one of Raila's uh, brothers who was called Agola. He was a very close friend of mine, and Raila's father and my father went to the same school, uh, Maseno High School. Mm -hmm. And Jeremy would tell me these stories about what uh, they were doing in school. And uh, uh, I didn't see my father in that role at that time, but he told me my father was really a good footballer. Mm -hmm. uh, so we started these conversations, and I would go with uh, Agola uh, during, you know, holidays or halftime yeah. uh, to visit, you know, his family uh, in Kisumu, and he would also visit my family. Although my father died when I was in my first year mm. uh, in school, yes. uh, a bit of a challenge. But I've, in those conversations, uh, I, I took a little interest in politics. And then when I was in Form 1, after Tom Boyer came to uh, Alliance High School, mm. uh, I had a conversation with him. And then he invited me to just go and look at his library at his house at that time he was staying in Lovington. Wow. And that uh, very visit introduced me into reading, uh, which is uh, something I pursue passionately mm. even, even now. Mm. I read a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of literature, um, you know, uh, novels, the classics. Uh, I read biographies. Yeah. Um, I read a lot of old things that really don't that doesn't have to do with my profession. Yeah. Yeah. So there you are. You've met these greats in terms of politics at the time, and then there's a fire that starts burning inside of you. Yeah. So mainstream politics. How does that happen? It started burning while I was at the university. Mm. What impressed me when we were at the university was this conversation that uh, we could, uh, you know, have with the national leadership. And when I became a president of Students' Union, I, you know, the struggle against colonialism was at its height in Mozambique, in Angola, and even in Vietnam, you know, the Americans were in Vietnam. Uh, so as students, when I became president, and this is now what got me really into politics, uh, we decided to miss our meals, certain, you know, items in our meals. Uh, at the university at that time, we used to have a 
really a five course meal. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the breakfast was something we would, you know, get at the Hilton. You know, sausages, eggs, and all wow. that. So we said we miss certain items in our meals for one month. Mm -hmm. And we were able to collect quite a substantial amount of money to give to the liberation committee of the OAU, which was based in Dar es Salaam. Mm -hmm. And I took a delegation of university students to present what was not a small check mm. uh, to the liberation committee in Dar es Salaam. Uh, when we arrived, we flew Kenya Airways uh, to Dar es Salaam and we were met by the leadership uh, of the Tanzanian government, uh, OAU officials. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, so we thought we were playing politics big time because <laughs> uh, we were talking about the freedom of southern Africa and, yes. and so on and so forth. So from then on, I started participating in local politics. Uh, um, I became very interested in politics mm -hmm. in, in the constituency, right. not uh, in terms of uh, running for an election, but just you know getting to know who is running and what he's doing, but eventually uh, I ran for office in 1980. In 1980. Yeah. Talk to us about the Bearded Sisters, because that's one of the things many people, perhaps uh, younger generations, will not know about. But there was that. Yeah, you know, politics was uh, uh, what I would call, you know, uh, a single stream kind of uh, politics, mm -hmm. because um, it was really about the leader, the president, and everybody followed what the president was saying. Uh, discussion and debate in the National Assembly was based on what the Kanu leadership wanted at mm -hmm, that time. Mm -hmm. So we decided, uh, seven of us, and we used to have meetings uh, about bills, or what positions do we take, and uh, we ended up being uh, seven in the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. And the seven of us, uh, forget about the tyranny of numbers, uh, seven of us against the entire leadership. Uh, of Kano in Parliament, we were able to give them a run for their money. And uh, how did you do that? Preparing ourselves very well on bills. So you knew your stuff. Yeah, we knew our stuff. Yeah. And those days, the good thing about uh, Parliament, you, if it was a bill, y you could, uh, you know, uh, contribute uh, for a day, for two days. I remember one time, I said I must sh break Shikuku's rep record. Because Shikuku could speak on a bill for two, three days. And I went on, I went on for two weeks. Two it, weeks? Yeah, yeah, on one bill. Wow. Uh, but, uh, of course, the, the rule was that, you know, so long as you're not repeating yourself. You've got you to be could, bringing yeah, yeah, something yeah, yeah, new. Yeah, you could go, Keep on, it going. Go, go on and on. So we used to prepare well. We used to ask a lot of uh, questions that uh, went deep down you know, the misdeeds of Khan at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, motions, we prepare motions. Uh, every Wednesday, one of us would have a motion uh, on the floor uh, for the So you met every week? We met every week. And then on the w or during the weekend, we were all over. Uh, Mwachofi would invite us to go to the coast, uh, particularly his constituency in Mwatate. We could go to Nakuru Mall, to Koyi Wamwere, Buya Buya in Kisi. So we were pretty busy. The difference was that th there were no too much demands. I mean, Harambe at that time had not really caught on. Yeah. Uh, so when you go to, uh, let's say, Wundani or, or Matate, uh, the debate there was not really how much money you would contribute over weekend. Yeah. But we engage with the local leadership. We'd engage with the people. Uh, you, he would uh, make sure that he had, you know, a group of people would talk to or a public meeting. And you know, on that point, because now we have tyranny of numbers, and you said uh, with seven people you were still able to make an impact. Yeah, so yeah. why is it difficult now? It, it is get? difficult because, you know, people are programmed like robots. You know, uh, you start to make a point, people shout. Uh, during those fist days. Fist fights. Yeah, fist fight. During those days, so long as you are making a point. People listen. People would listen. I remember most of the time when I was uh, making a contribution in Parliament. And because you're hitting the other side so hard, uh, you would not find people making a lot of noise. So mm -hmm. long as you're you are relevant, they would listen. And somebody would prepare himself, you know, to respond. Okay. Uh, probably not adequately. Uh, and then we had a speaker, Marty, very quiet man, 
And the speaker at that time made sure you never see Speaker Martin in State House, you never see him in the public functions, although the party was very strong, mm -hmm. to give the office of the speaker the dignity and the authority uh, that uh, it was it not denies, influenced yeah. by the executive. Uh, and sometimes he would uh, send a word and say, you know, I, I want you to uh, say something about this. Mm -hmm. uh, it is an important bill. Um, it looks even the debate is going off course. Uh, so he would invite you and tell you, you know, there's an important bill coming. Mm -hmm. I'm not telling you what to say, but to make sure that the record of the debate would show that, you know, uh, yeah. these issues were brought out. A and then came the detentions. Yeah. Why are you detained? Yeah, I mean, I was, first of all, prosecutions. I think I'm one of the people who had uh, the highest number of prosecutions. <laughs> I, I can't remember not spending a day in, in a cell in Nyeri, in Mombasa, in Kisi, in Vihiga, mm -hmm. all over. In fact, even by the time we had the elections in 2002, when Kibaki became president, mm -hmm. I think I had about 15 pending you know, criminal cases. Um, oh, wow. Part of my work was just running around, you'd be locked up. But the period I spent in detention after I went to exile in Tanzania, mm. and recently I went to visit in Tanzania, and I was talking to my colleagues where I was being held up in Tanzania mm. at a time when there was an exchange of uh, citizens, Tanzanian citizens who, who were suspected of, you know, um, uh, plotting a coup in Tanzania. Mm and then Kenyans who were living then in Tanzania, including people like Ochuka, who, who were exchanged. And then when we came here, I spent um, uh, six months in committee and six months in uh, Russia. Wow. All through that period, except the period when I was in uh, committee, uh, where we, I shared a, ch a cell with Ochuka uh, and one of the uh, military guys. Mm. Um, uh, in Naivasha, I was in solitary confinement for six months. I had only 15, min 15 minutes to go to the bathroom, take a shower, uh, 15 minutes to go out in the sun. Oh. Uh, and the cells that we lived in uh, was a single blanket, blanket and a mat. And uh, everything else after that 15 minutes in the morning, you did in that uh, small room. The that would get somebody. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the worst part of it, now when they started interrogating us, uh, they would fill this cell with water. You know, they, pu they put um, uh, pieces of cloth wow. and blankets at the door, uh, the aperture below, uh, and then put sand, and then they fill the cell with water uh, about knee deep uh, uh, and you know <laughs> by about three four days uh, you 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 would uh, give up because how do you the, remain the, sane the, the, the water becomes cold, cold yeah. you are naked in the cell uh, and uh, initially you say I, I, I can't help myself I can't do my toilet please inside the cell after three or four days, you give up, and um, you know your feet start swelling. Um, and eventually, when they think you're, you're 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 passing out, they open the door. And at that time, if you didn't give a piece of information that they desired, mm. you are allowed two weeks or a week to recuperate, and you're taken back to the same kind of treatment. What do you think got you to pull through that period of time you spent? Well, sometimes you are being accused of what you don't know anything about. So they will try to punish you, you know, put you into that water, but you will not give an answer that they desire because you don't know anything about it. Mm. Uh, so at the end of the day, you, they would give up. Uh, but, um, you know, of course, the group I was with at, at that time were mm. the, uh, the, the soldiers who had run into Tanzania. Yeah. All of them were, of course, uh, subsequently prosecuted mm. and executed and uh, it, it, it was not a good thing to, to, to remember because I had lived with some of them in Tanzania and a few of them you know really didn't know anything about the coup it's just that they were soldiers yeah. and decided to run to Tanzania and, and within 18 months 
Uh, by the time when he came back, you know, they were, they were, they were executed. And then 1997, you decided to go up against Moy in the election. Yes. What got you to, to decide that this young man <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> will face up yeah. against uh, Kanu? You know, in 1997, everybody was like, uh, you know, um, 1997 was when we, we were now uh, coming together as an opposition to try and make the rules of the game fair. We had had one struggle to bring one uh, a multi-party system of government, that was in 1990-92. But 1997, uh, the struggle was about, you know, a new constitutional order that would make it, make it possible mm -hmm. to have free and fair elections. And uh, in 1997, I um, ran as a, a Ford Kenya a candidate in Uganda. And Raila as well? Uh, Raila was, was at that running. time the leader of the National uh, Development Party, the NDP. Yeah. Um, and he ran for president. Um, uh, but the most important thing to remember at that time, we, we were trying, you know, to show the difference between the opposition uh, and Kanu, which had been in government for a long time. And uh, the, the, the differences that came about was, do we go together as a, an opposition? And why in not? Our, and in our various political parties. Yeah. But at the end of the day, in 2002, that desire became a reality. Why was it impossible then to, to, to go together? Because then there's more power in that. I, I think at that time, uh, people were of the opinion that uh, the best candidate will win, mm. uh, which was impossible about uh, uh, a government and a party which was fully in control. Uh, fully in control of the um, elections uh, commi electoral commission, uh, fully in charge of government and controlling the media. So the, it was not uh, 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 what I call a level playing field yeah. for political parties at that time. You, yeah. and, and in order to make sure that it was possible to have a contest against Kano, this issue of unity became critical. And that was achieved yeah. in the year two or two. Do you think going separate ways with Raila at the time cost you your parliamentary seat as well? No, I won. Mm -hmm. I won. But people didn't understand why, you know, we had to go separate ways. Mm. I, we went separate ways in two or two, uh, in the elections of two or two. Yeah. Uh, my position at that time was that, uh, you know, we needed a party uh, which was transformative. Uh, because when everybody was coming together, you know, it was uh, not an election based on any ideological position. Mm. Uh, and eventually I did say and admit that, you know, it was important for people to get together to remove Kanu from power. Yeah. But, you know, the problem then we have dealt with since that election is that, um, you know, the elections are not really based on what people stand for. Uh, the issue of ideology, you know, uh, is not taken seriously uh, because I, I think consistently if somebody was judged on his track record uh, from the point of entry into politics, mm. the sacrifices that one has made, the political party that uh, uh, somebody is in, in terms of organization, ideology, uh, then somebody like Raila Odinga should have been president of Kenya a long time ago. Mm. Uh, or Jaramogi, you know, in 1992. Mm -hmm. uh, but because our politics are not based on free and fair elections and tend to congregate around uh, et ethnic groups mm -hmm. or tribalism, it is in, it's sometimes very difficult for a political party that stands for a good and a great idea mm -hmm. uh, to win elections until you create a fair uh, and uh, level playing, playing ground. Playing. Uh, let's talk a bit about elections because we are getting to one in 2017 and one of the proposals in the OCOA uh, bill, uh, you now presented the signatures to the IBC, is around uh, reforms in the Electoral Commission. So mm. you're saying that one of the things you want is to the commission to ensure 80% mm. uh, of Kenyans in every constituencies are registered putting that at IBC's door, it's its responsibility. Yeah. Some say that's untenable. Why should it be forced, quote unquote, in the Supreme Law to do that? No, no, it, it, it's not untenable. There are some countries where 
it is an offence not to register as a voter. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking at the registration of voters and uh, the issues of identity cards, you'd find it has got a functional link with the way elections are held and contested. Take like uh, Kakamega, a county with the highest population uh, and uh, a county with the highest number of constituencies mm -hmm. uh, outside Nairobi. Uh, but when we find in terms of registration of voters and the issues of uh, identity cards, uh, they do not feature amongst the highest in terms of percentages. But in terms of ID issuance, mm. for while you had God rest his soul in peace, Kajuang in charge, yeah. and then when you're talking about, you know, now IBC getting pulled to register, you cannot force someone go register. No, no, no. For example, right now you'd find in uh, uh, places like Western Province or even Nyanza, the registration for identity uh, of people actually turn up to register uh, for purposes of getting identity mm -hmm. cards. But once that information comes to Nairobi, these identity cards are held in Nairobi for so long, or they end up not being you know, sent back mm -hmm. uh, on the ground. Uh, so whereas the figures look high when you, you try to calculate the number of people who have applied, for identity cards. Mm -hmm. Those identity cards, once they, they, they are produced here in Nairobi, they, are, they don't get back to, to the ground. And uh, I think this is a political uh, process, which then translates into those who register as voters and eventually, uh, you know, those who cast their ballot. So other than advertising, publicity, asking people to come out and vote, how does IEBC achieve 80%? Yeah, the, the IBC achieves 80%, uh, one, uh, because we want a linkage between issues of identity cards and registration of voters. Mm -hmm. And we are saying in each county, which is achievable, because in some areas, they were able to achieve more than 100% registration, mm -hmm. which calls a lot into question. We have the figures, uh, you know, in some parts of the country, if you look at uh, the... the uh, the plans for registration of voters for IEBC. In some areas, they were, they were registering, registering more than 100% mm -hmm. of those eligible to be voters. Uh, and in some areas, they were not able to go beyond 70, 80%. Okay. Uh, so yeah. um, since IEBC can do it in certain areas, why can they be able to do it? But in, in and one would areas? argue each part has its own challenges. It's not all uniform. That there will be an argument for this county mm. and the other. The same way we are not all in the same place no, no, as no, a country. It, no, no, no. Those challenges yeah. should not deny somebody with, uh, uh, that which is a right, even right. under the current law. Yes. Getting an ID, Article, I think Article 12 of the Constitution, a passport and identity card is no, an, a right, not a privilege. Mm. Yeah, so, I mean, once people play games in government to make sure that some other areas are well catered for and other areas are not well catered for, it calls into question the political process. Right. And uh, I, I want to tell you, Kajuan tried very hard uh, in cabinet and uh, trying to bring plans, you know, uh, on how this could be achieved, the money that was required, and remember, Kajuang's ministry was a department within uh, the vice president's Imagine. office. Okay. So, so he was not totally and completely in charge. And also on IBC, when there's a proposal on this bill to have parties depending on pol uh, parliamentary strength, uh, appoint members to the IEBC. Are mm. we not digging ourselves into a hole? Because then don't you have these individuals risking to be beholden to these parties? And then at the end of the day, they are serving interests. No, no, no. We have had it before. Uh, after the, uh, uh, the discussions that we had in 1997 mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the desire to create an independent electoral commission, uh, although Moi had appointed 11 commissioners, he allowed or rather by legislation it was not, it now became possible to have more than 21 about 21 commissioners and who are divided to political parties mm -hmm. and it brought some sense and one can understand why it, then it was possible in the subsequent elections mm. in 2002 for you know the opposition to win 
And by the way, you know, th that practice is there in Zimbabwe, I mean in Mozambique, mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, uh, the Electoral Commission, by its sheer membership, for it to carry its mandate, there, there must be a consensus that brings about uh, a goodwill in the political process during the elections. Uh, so that, um, uh, you know, in the commission, uh, we want the, the stakeholders uh, to be represented. Okay. Uh, and in, the, in Mozambique, is a member of civil society who chairs the electoral commission. The rest of the membership is uh, from the same civil society mm -hmm. and uh, political parties. And political parties. Yeah, because even bishops, you know, and the clergy, they also got their political positions. Yeah. So you cannot have a truly uh, independent non -partisan and non-partisan electoral commission yeah. until you show that this, 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 this needs and interest are balanced in are balanced. Yeah. And then called for the longest time since actually the last election has said time and again they do not have confidence in this IABC as it's currently constituted. However, this process will be managed by the same IABC. So isn't there a contradiction to trust it with this referendum process and then and, and a, a process that then would even kick them out and then say when it comes to elections we don't trust you. Where do you, no, how we, do you reconcile no, no, that? No, we are taking a, a, a risk and a bet. Uh, because we want to bring change through constitutional processes. Uh, for example, if you want to amend the constitution, you want to change government, you have, got to, you have to follow constitutional processes. Now, if we want to amend the constitution mm -hmm. to change the membership or the constitution of the electoral commission, we have to follow a legal process. Uh, uh, we are not going to raid the electoral commission and say, you get out. <laughs> Uh, so, um, if there was an alternative path provided by the law, uh, we could do it. And the only path is to go through a constitutional process. Yes. yes. And land is also one of the areas yes. that this bill is focusing yes. on. You are once yes. land minister. In fact, the, a while back you, you gave um, testimony or submission about the fact that you said you were not involved in the allotment of land in Lamu yes. and that there were other individuals uh, concerned. Land and at the time when you were at the helm there was land that was illegally allocated to people. Yeah. So the fact that you were there, you've seen this mess, you've seen the challenges. Now what needs to happen for Kenya? You, you know, actually if you look at the record you'll find it very difficult to, to pinpoint any one case mm. uh, where the allocation of land went to the level of the commissioner and came to me where there would be an illegal allocation. That I can bet with you. Uh, and if people want to criminalize politics or decision, I'm prepared for that also. But, you know, the current land laws were based on the fact that unless you removed, you know, the administration of land, from a politically uh, established and appointed executive, then land is going to continue to be a question uh, that is politically driven. And therefore, an, an independent commission was required to deal with the issues of land mm -hmm. so that uh, uh, the, 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 the scheme in the law at that time that make it, made it possible for the president, essentially the president, and the Commission of Lands mm -hmm. to hold land on behalf of the Republic, which is a repli replication of the colonial law, then you would replace it by a commission considered, uh, you know, which is an independent commission established by the Constitution. And you'll have the counties and communities having uh, a stake and an interest in the way the land was managed. And so, all uh, that will revolve around the commission. So, uh, the, 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 the amendments that are now being, you know, proposed in the land laws and, uh, you know, the bills that I've seen mm -hmm. is trying to take us back to where we were. And, you know, some people are feeling that land is so important. Why should, why should land, you know, be managed by a commission which is outside the executive? That if... Um, the legal tender can have, you know, the, 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 the signature of an executive 
the picture of, 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 of who is sitting in the state house, yeah. although the law, uh, the, the law change, why is it that a commission would issue a title in, so in its this name bill, yeah. rather than the, the government? So you want the NLC strengthened? Yeah, yeah. That o is although one of them would find difficulty mm -hmm. in as far as how we've seen things played out, there was the pull between the minister and the NLC for a while, and then they said they settled the issues, but still we saw some protracted issues continuing. But after that, after the minister was asked to step aside, then we saw your... Uh, one of the principals, that's Kalonzo Musioka, going in support of her, who for the longest time court had said she's the person standing in the way uh, of some of the problems and things that have been sought to be done to ensure this works out. Yeah, you know, one of uh, honorable... So we never escape from politics, it, it, You know, like, Honorable Stephen Kalonzo mm -hmm. was not going to give support and solidarity uh, to Charity Ngilu on the basis of the issue of land. Uh, he was going there on the basis of using the criminal justice system to target people in manners that raise certain questions. Uh, and if you, you, you find this is the debate that is going on now. Although we are calling people's name, Waiguru, Koske, but the question that people are asking is that the criminal justice system should not be politicized. Let, let's talk about your colleague Senator Wetangula who's also a principal in court. Right now uh, the story has been saving Wetangula that you're saying this is not a criminal matter but at the end of the day there are those who say it's clear it's outright the Supreme Court found what it found that there was bribery that he's linked to it and therefore his name should be struck off the register's role. Now if you look at the story where it began mm -hmm. the court in Bungoma the judge was forced after he delivered judgment when the question arose, is Wetangula entitled to run for elections? Because the by-elections was coming in December uh, 2013. And the judge took the very unorthodox way of dealing with the matter. He had to put it in writing, uh, subsequent to delivery of judgment, mm -hmm. that I did not stop Senator Wetangula. My judgment did not stop Senator Wetangula from running uh, in a subsequent by-election. So when the appeal went to the, uh, to the, uh, to the court in Kisumu, mm -hmm. the court of appeal is the one which disqualified Senator Wetangula to run as a candidate in any subsequent election. Come the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, in its judgment, disagreed uh, with the court of appeal. And they said uh, in their judgment that they have quashed the order of the court of appeal. Uh, uh, stopping Senator Wetangula from participating in the elections. And that is the position as we speak today. And all that the, uh, the electoral commission, uh, I mean the Supreme Court was now saying, you cannot punish somebody on the basis of election proceedings in a, a, a mandated court mm -hmm. to punish somebody for something which belongs to a criminal trial process. Uh, because conviction for an election offense is not a matter can, that can be dealt with by an elections court. This is what the Supreme Court was saying. Uh, and uh, they uh, said that their judgment sh should be sent to the Attorney General, to the speakers of the two houses of parliament, for purposes of, of ensuring that the election uh, 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 the procedure for contesting election results is not used as a criminal court. So criminal liability is what you want to ensure happens, but at yeah. the end of the day the courts across the board did agree that bribery happened yes. and from his camp. Yes. So isn't that then alone by itself, someone looking, because yeah, there's a lot of legalists that could go on and yeah, this and yeah, this But at the end happen. of the day it's yes. like saying if you miscounted votes or if by any reason a vote was counted which was not supposed to be counted and was struck out, struck out by the court, that would be an ir irregularity that would uh, make the election court, you know, overturn that election mm -hmm. and nullify that election. Uh, so uh, the question of bri bribery is in the nature of an election uh, malpractice or misconduct, but it's not a conviction. Mm. as understood in a, in, a, in, a, in a criminal law. So they're saying if you want us to convict Senator Wetangula and therefore punish him in terms of the election act, 
then he has to go through a criminal process. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, there, there are many elections which have been overturned on many of the irregularities. Okay. Uh, and they, they, they are not tied down to criminal offenses. So you're seeking legal recourse to which court are you going? We are not said we are going to court as yet. As yet. So you're yeah, waiting yeah, for the decision yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but by we, IABC? We, uh, we are not even waiting for that decision. We are saying before you can make a decision, you have to give a hearing. And the Constitution requires you that okay. if you are, want to make a decision that is going to adversely affect anybody, then you've got to give that person a so hearing. Have you already made that request to the yeah, yes, 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 yes. And you, they you, have you, you responded? Have to, you have written to them. Mm -hmm. And the indications is that they are going to give that hearing. Okay. And, and by the way, <laughs> you know, strictly if the law had to be applied in terms of the Elections Act, the law could only be used to stop Senator Wetangula from running in the subsequent election. Mm. Not leaving office yeah, 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 at this yeah, particular point. Because this election now this is is, 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 has not secure. been contested. Okay. Yeah, the election that was contested uh, was the one which uh, was subject to the proceedings in Bungoma. All right. Yeah. We have about five minutes to go. Talk yeah. to me about, from where you sit, the state of the nation. There's been a lot of talk about corruption. Uh, the devolution CS has been on the spotlight. Now we have Mangiti coming out. There's been stories left, right, and center. What needs to happen to ensure that Kenya uh, doesn't continue this may, may I, I want really to give an honest opinion that this government is dysfunctional. And it's dysfunctional because it does not respect, you know, uh, constitutional uh, institutions. For example, we have been just been talking about the National Land Commission, and uh, the National Police Service also is <laughs> on target. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, we, we see a process where the law that uh, affects the media, the, the freedoms of individuals, and attack all the time. Uh, I, I'm, by the way, like I've done in the past many years before, I find myself representing just journalists. There's a media, big case that we have with the media houses, and I'm representing the journalists and uh, the editors' girls, uh, which is something I used to do a lot during Moy's time, uh, defending journalists. Uh, and now I find myself in the same kind of situation, mm. uh, that even the Bill of Rights is under attack. Journalists are under attack. Uh, and you know, Parliament is being used uh, in the most, uh, you know, ridiculous fashion, where you find, you know, the President has uh, elected that, you know, the safest bet for him is to work with the National Assembly mm -hmm. to the exclusion of the Senate. And you know, as we speak today, there's only one bill from the Senate, despite the many bills that have been passed in the Senate, there's only one bill that I've seen, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, the president giving presidential assent, mm. and that is the sang bill. Uh, uh, because the way governments are su supposed to work is that uh, whereas, like the judiciary has a head, within it, it's got institutions uh, which afford it checks and balances from within the judiciary itself. For example, the Supreme Court is the last court. Mm -hmm. you, you can't run to the Supreme Court. Uh, within Parliament, the checks and balances are there between the two houses. And therefore, any law that is passed in Parliament is an act of Parliament and not an act of the National Assembly or the Senate. So when you and say it's dysfunctional... And then you'll find a situation where now the President is becoming a lawmaker uh, to, by using the veto. Instead of expressing reservations, you'd find when he's uh, returning a bill back to Parliament on the basis of veto, he is actually making um, proposals through a mem memorandum, uh, drafting pieces of legislation that then do not go through, you know, the um, the, the, the statutory and constitutional. And processes. you're going to court about that. That one is, we are not just going to court. Is a matter already in court in the case that we are doing with the media houses mm -hmm. and uh, well, with the journalist uh, case that we are now handling. Yeah. And um, court also has also subsequently filed a case. Uh, so this dysfunction uh, has made it possible for now the executive even to push the National Assembly by raising the debt ceiling every time that they want to borrow money or 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 or. or 
you know, um, girl uh, sell stocks and securities. But we'd never hear the opposition coming out in these particular cases. They sit in these committees, they are part of parliament, that whilst they may not have the numbers, as you said yeah, earlier, yeah, yeah. it is possible to still come out and have that voice count. But I can tell you, if you look at the debate, look at the handset, mm. the voices that have been there. And I think even uh, during Moe's time when parliament was at its weakest, you'd find that uh, uh, J.M. Kariki would pass a bill that went through, you know, the grain. Uh, but if you look, listen to the voices of certain members of parliament or, or, on even these issues, the issue of debt, uh, or even the issue of, you know, passing bills that are unconstitutional, mm. uh, those voices are there. And, um, you know, the executive says, you know, they won't listen. Yeah, and, and right now, uh, I think that uh, the, the way we're handling even the security organs uh, under the pretext of uh, terrorism uh, is going to drive the country down to where we were uh, 30 years ago. So at the end of the day, if you ask the ordinary Kenyan, because this is a, an important question, mm. do you feel better as a person in, in the sense of your security, uh, your, your standard of living, uh, the cost of, of living, and all these, you know, indexes, a lot of them will tell you that, you know, we're not happy. Mm. Uh, although probably, you know, uh, what they are going through will not determine their political choices. But a lot of people you meet ordinarily, even in areas where there's overwhelming support for the government, they're, they're saying uh, this is not what, you know, uh, okay. we, we voted for or betted for. So your confident code will take it come 2017? Well, <laughs> me, I can tell you, if there's free and fair elections, uh, I, I think the, the possibilities are better than they <laughs> have ever been before. You've learned uh, lessons uh, from uh, the uh, other and, one, uh, you're putting... Uh, and uh, 207, you know, uh, you know, the ODM won the election. Uh, without a doubt, we were there at KICC uh, and uh, 2013. Uh, if you listen to this uh, uh, lawyer, Katie, you know, there's one thing she demonstrated. Uh, and I think that was her biggest, her biggest role, mm. that you can actually rig an election that has been conducted fairly <laughs> At, at the level of polling stations, but as the results are being transmitted, you know, uh, through the use of technology and the use of, of Form 34 and 36, you, you can change the result of that election. Um, and you know, that is why there's a wisdom in the Constitution. The Constitution says presiden presidential elections will be held in the constituencies. That is there in the law. Presidential held, uh, elections are not held nationally. Mm. And one of the things the court is proposing, let the returning officers at the constitu uh, constituencies declare the results. Mm. The, the results will not be on the basis of transmissions. They will be declared, declared at that point. At that point. And, and you remember in the election of Gore and uh, Bush, mm. the lawyers were able just to go and contest the results in Florida. Uh, because the elections were being contact, uh, conducted in the state of Florida, okay. in a particular county. Mm. Uh, and the results uh, counted and uh, the, the, the returns are made at in the states. Mm. So even now what we're proposing, let the results be those declared and at they the should be at the constituency. All right. Would you ever consider to vote for presidency? Well, I think there's a bigger question, how yeah. to transform Kenya to transform and Kenya. give people the promises of this constitution. All right. I think that's the agenda we have. All right. Thank you so, so much, sir, you. for being with us this morning. Yeah. Senator Jane Sorengo, Siaya County, uh, with us on the person of interest this morning. I wish we had more time. It feels like we have not even gotten to a lot of the issues <laughs> we wanted to discuss this morning, but all the way uh, has been a great conversation. To first get to know him a little bit more in his political past and his life, uh, but also what he thinks about some of these national issues. Thank you for watching.